The Internet History Podcast is brought to you by MetaLab. Their slogan is MetaLab, we make interfaces. For a decade, MetaLab has helped some of the world's top companies and entrepreneurs build products that millions of people use every day. You probably didn't realize it at the time, but the odds are you've used an app that they've helped design or build. Apps like Slack, Coinbase, Facebook Messenger, Oculus, Lonely Planet, and many more. MetaLab wants to bring their unique design philosophy to your project. Let them take your brainstorm and turn it into the next billion-dollar app, from idea sketched on the back of a napkin to a final shipped product. Check them out at metalab.co. That's metalab.co. Welcome to the Internet History Podcast. I'm your host, Brian McCullough. It has bothered me for a while now that over the last five years or so of this podcast, we haven't focused very much on certain corners of the history of the Internet. For example, what about the legal side? Copyright law, intellectual property law, how much have we talked about disruption and piracy and file sharing and all that stuff, but we haven't really delved into understanding how the law has evolved along with technology. So I spoke to Richard Chapo, who has been doing internet law since the web went mainstream. In this episode, we talk about the Napster era. We talk about how much of an influence the adult industry had on digital law. We talk about the state of digital law today. And actually, we talk a whole bunch about contemporary stuff like GDPR. Please enjoy this conversation with Richard Chapo, Esquire. Richard Chapo, thanks for coming on the Internet History Podcast. Thank you for having me on. Well, as uh, we were just discussing off air, uh, I'm so excited because I don't know a lot about like um, the legality of the Internet and, and the web and how it's evolved. So let's um, I'm excited. I'm excited to learn. Let's let's start really basic. Um to the best of your uh, knowledge, because acknowledging you weren't there at the time, the legal framework of the internet before the commercial era. Um, so, like, it was kind of quasi owned by the government, that sort of thing. Like, was there any sort of precedent for that sort of thing? Like, I guess it's just a set of rules for users and whatnot. Like, what was pre the web becoming mainstream? What was the le- the legal framework of the internet? Um, you're right. It wasn't there, but, um, uh, there really wasn't one, uh, really the regulations didn't exist. What you saw primarily from my understanding was a breakdown based on, um, academic guidelines and ethical guidelines because you saw it used, uh, you know, primarily for that purpose. And then as well as, uh, you know, potentially internal government regulations, ironically from the military, cause there was, uh, an aspect of that, uh, in the use uh, but there really wasn't any um, legal structure as we think of it, per se. You know, there was this kind of struggle of what is it going to be? What kind of laws do we need to issue? Uh, we'd never had laws that were even based on concepts like, you know, what is you know an Internet domain? How are we going to define that? Mm-hmm. You know, I, I can, um, you know, all of these groups. That, well, that I mean, to even, be. even on the level of ownership, I mean, the, the concept, again, th- there was a time when you couldn't, legally own things on the internet you couldn't do commerce on the internet but so there's no framework for if i aside from owning a domain like if i post something to a news group do i own what i've said right yeah no and we've spent 30 40 years now arguing over that (laughs) okay well this is what i want to learn about yeah we have we have a better idea now but it is still something that's um you know contested frequently i mean i'll give you just a quick example we can talk about later but there are new regulations that are coming up based on um you know i call it the empire strikes back period of the internet where where governments are coming online and trying to to you know issue laws saying essentially if you if you do business in our country you know you have to comply with these laws and so we're having this big debate over personal jurisdiction again you know if google is you know a us company but they're doing business in europe do they have to comply with european laws and do they have to apply those european laws you know all across google's properties even if they're in other countries and what if those laws conflict with those other countries? Well, so is it is it a 
uh, again, uh, being completely a novice at this sort of thing, is it the concept of is, its platforms where, like if I wrote a book or I published a magazine article or somebody somebody published a magazine article that I wrote, like there were clearly defined um, case law and, 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 and statutes and things like that in place. But at the very early Wild West days of the internet, like that's not even defined like the idea of what you have digitally posted on this platform was not even defined not particularly that people had thoughts on it certainly copyright being one of the big issues of course so if you had created a a work offline and then it was you know transposed online well the argument would be that you still owned it maybe it was a derivative work where we were we going to say that everything that was in the physical copyright spectrum that was put online was now derivative or was it something unique and new um, you know, the most basic legal questions, uh, you know, were unanswered. And so, you know, we started getting legislation in the late 1990s, uh, the DMCA, the Communications Decency Act, things like that. And then we had cases that, you know, people don't even really realize there was a case, for instance, called Perfect 10 versus Amazon, um, which ironically involved Google. Mm. Uh, and it was a question of if Google takes thumbnails of images that it sees on pages and lists them. Uh, as part of a search result, is that copyright infringement? And uh, in that case, it was Perfect 10. Perfect 10 was an adult company. Mm -hmm. A lot of the adult companies actually set most of the law. Uh, and we're, it went we're on. We're going to come to that. We're going to come to that. Don't worry. Right. Go ahead. <laughs> and it went on, and eventually, court ruled uh, that no, that's not. But if the court had ruled that that was copyright infringement, well, think of how many different ways thumbnails and reduced images and avatars and everything else are used online. I mean, it's just a basic thing. Uh, and that, that would not be the case if it had, you know, if the court had ruled differently. Okay, so um, first of all, I'm gonna I'm gonna take what seems like a little bit of a detour, but I'm I'm again I'm I'm trying to feel my way towards what I think is is the interesting part here. Like the, do you know anything about the history of things like terms of service, terms of use, like in in the in the sense of tech that comes from software, right? Like a software license. Yes. Yeah, it's primarily that's primarily where it came from before the web, and you had, um, yeah, you, you had all kinds of different licenses. And then the question was, once you went online, you know, are they going to apply? Well, a lot of people don't understand, particularly about terms of uh, in terms of conditions, terms of service, is that um, they're just basic legal issues that are being dealt with in there. So, for instance, if you um, let's say I have a website and you're going to upload something to it, so say it's a form. Okay, well, technically, we have to deal with issues of copyright and my authorized use of that. Um, if it's your real name or your image, you know, what about your rights to publicity? And so terms and conditions will contain one of those boilerplate clauses that everybody hates um, that says you are giving the website the permission to republish that on the website. Now, it's something that we do naturally, you know, now that we're online, um, but that is something that was dealing with legal issues that existed before the web. So if you think of copyright law, trademark law, uh, licensing any of those things, you know, they all existed first offline. Well, and, and that's a theme that comes up so much on the show is that especially in the early days, um, because no one knows what the web and the internet really are or what they're going to be good for. So they're grafting these sort of models from, from other media, like, you know, the whole concept of a page view and CPM comes from magazines and newspapers. And so it's similar in the law, like because there's no one knows what it is quite yet. They're just kind of grafting these models from previous days. Right. And so you get solutions that um, are laughably unworkable and solutions that, you know, make some sense. So with terms and conditions, for instance, I mean, we've all seen you go to a site and uh, you scroll to the bottom and there's a little link that says terms and conditions or terms of service or whatever. Nobody does that. Nobody mm -hmm. goes down. Mm -hmm. Nobody clicks that. I mean, it's, it's useless. It's a completely unworkable solution. But for about 10 or 15 years, that was kind of the standard for, you know, how you, you bound visitors on a website to uh, your terms and conditions. Now, in the real world, you know, that would never work. You just can't have that kind of a, an application based on contract law. But for a long time, we allowed it to work on the internet. Now we don't. Um, now we've seen a, a complete switch, and in many, you know, many cases, when you go to purchase something or join a site, you know, you'll be forced, forced to check a box that says "Yes, I agree" to the terms and conditions. Well, that's what you're doing. That's you know, it's called click wrap agreement, and you're moving to a new solution that's a little more applicable to the real world, but also works online and acts you know, more as a traditional contract. Okay, one more thing that I want to poke at before we get to um, how the uh, adult industry sort of led us to the future. Um, what the concept of 
identity online or user generated content this is sort of like copyright stuff um but was there any outside of the internet and digital was there any concept of that where um and again copyright is the obvious thing so maybe i'm asking a dumb question but um what i do the media that i produce um was there any other precedent for that before the digital era for like like just just by generating it i own it Yes, yes, under basic copyright law, regardless of whether it's online or off, mm -hmm. that's still the mm -hmm. case. You have what's called common law copyright. Mm -hmm. and, and so when you create uh, a word, I call it, and a lot of people aren't going to like this, I call it idiot rule. Mm. Uh, so you think about an author, somebody's writing their first book, uh, and they spend you know six months or a year, whatever it is, creating the book. Well, when they finish, the first thing they're not going to you know the, think about is copyright. I mean, they're thinking about how am I going to sell the book, this, that, and the other. And so there was, there's always been a default provision where you automatically own the copyright. Now, whether you can sue, you know, for uh, infringement, and you know, those are other steps that are involved. Okay, maybe what I'm asking is, what about the concept of identity, where um, I, I have a persona, right? Um, so that I, my, my screen name or my avatar or even like my reputation on, say, eBay or something like that, like that's something that I have ownership of. E <laughs> that, yes, that's that's yes. still unsettled today. <laughs> No, no, it's it's settled, but it's not settled with a clear black and white rule. The problem mm. is what's the value of that ownership or what's the value of that that identity. So if it's your true name, then yes, and you have you have um, rights to that not online or offline. It's called right of publicity. You have identity theft, all those kinds of issues. Once you move to an anonymous uh, character, though, an avatar or something of that sort, then it becomes a question of is it unique? Um, what value is associated with that? You know, if I just go slap up, you know, a brand new avatar that I just made on a form and I post one post, you know, I don't really have a right to control, um, you know, any other avatar under that name. You know, there's trademark issues. It gets into a confusing area. Um, so identity is something that's kind of mm, kind of flowing online. In mm. fact, we're seeing right now, uh, you know, resurgence of uh, right of publicity cases. Right of publicity just means you have the right to control your image, your name. Uh, things of this sort, uh, and people are coming back with that as an addition to copyright infringement because you often see infringements uh, that associate the name or the the identity of the source. Um, so it is still somewhat unsettled. Um, I'll be honest with you, I haven't dealt with many cases yeah. in that area. It's mostly just going to come back to the copyright or the you know the underlying. Uh, That's legal funny. Issue. On on uh, my daily podcast, I just did a story. I think it was last week about uh, for Fortnite, like the the dance moves that they're generating avatars for and people are suing because they're like that's my dance move but anyway I, i'm getting off track here well, no no that's that's actually a very pertinent case because it points out a lot of the issues that we have which is um you know in the offline world how would that apply mm -hmm. and the chances of it coming up would probably be pretty remote but in the online world where we have you know fortnite's doing very well it's very successful uh, you know how many movements is a copyrightable performance um you're getting into all these kinds of questions and uh, you know, in some cases, I'm not familiar with copyright law and dance moves, but, uh, you know, there may be some guidance out there. But these are the things that go on that you know, they're hard to um, apply an off-world standard to an on-world situation. Are, are you aware of the Prince Baby case, the YouTube Prince Baby case? Yeah. Well, and also, by the way, what I did learn by doing that story was that uh, dance moves are technically not covered, but choreography is. So, like, you can't – the hustle you can't – claim ownership of apparently but anyway go go on with the the, the prince uh, story yeah right so for listeners who aren't aware of it it was a, a case where a woman had her baby dancing and it, she was dancing to a prince song it was a, about 20 second clip of a prince song and the music publisher sued um and then you know she it became very public and people funded her defense it went on for 10 years uh, and the argument was, you know, is it fair use? Is it not fair use? Is it copyright infringement? What would damages be? All these things. And this is recent. This was ended, you know, last year. And so we're talking about something as simple as that, and we're still struggling with the issues of, well, is fair use applied? Does it not apply? Um, because particularly on the internet, you know, you're having copyright, which was kind of an antiquated concept offline. Um, that's that's become front and center because, uh, you know, if you're offline and you want to commit copyright infringement, well, let's say I take a Stephen King book. I'm gonna have to take apart the book. I'm gonna have to copy each page. I'm gonna have to put it all back together. It's you know, there's a lot of labor involved. Whereas online, it's just right click, save, you know, publish. Uh, and so we see even now, uh, you know, a lot of new areas that are opening up. So uh, 
tell me how how did the adult industry sort of uh, blaze the trail for the the, the legality and, and the questions involved in the online world? Um, well, the adult world uh, was one of the areas where monetization really wasn't a problem online originally. Uh, you could you know you had all the uh, the membership sites and things of that sort. And so they had the money, basically, quite honestly, to argue it and you know to argue about all these issues when the first internet boom came and went, you know, in the late 1990s. One of the problems was that people were having issues monetizing uh, their sites. You know, everybody looks at Google today as this giant, and they are. You know, but Google had all kinds of problems trying to monetize its search engine at one point, and in fact, there were allegations. Let's put it that way: that you know they essentially borrowed AdWords, you know, from uh, GoTo and Overture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so on and so forth. And Yahoo ended up suing them over that. And uh, you know, rumor has it Yahoo owns a significant amount of Google stock now because of that. <laughs> so, and we've talked uh, about that on this show many times. Yes, go on. Ah, so there you go. Uh, so in the adult industry, they had the money to go after these things. So you had situations where uh, in, in the adult industry, they're trying to control their content. And so they would sue over copyright. So a lot of the copyright law that you see established is based on that, like the Perfect 10 case we mentioned. You know, if you take an image and you reduce it to a thumbnail and list it in a search engine, is that copyright infringement? Well, those were adult images. And then you have the issue of pricing, uh, to where you go in and a lot of the adult sites, not a lot, but a lot of the more questionable sites would do these free trials. And the uh, free trials were you could sign up for three days and then you could cancel, except if you tried to cancel, it was nigh impossible. And so you had laws come up around um, everything from credit card security to what's allowable um, from a charge to what are called automatic um, reoccurring billing laws, which most states have. Um, and then you had a lot of tech developed on the side of uh, video uh, in particular, because obviously, you know, 1998, you're dealing with dial-up modems. It's not great for the adult industry. But as broadband comes on, the question becomes, OK, we can move content from our hosts, from our servers to the pipe, to the street, how do we get the last 100 feet from the street to the house? And so a lot of money in tech was developed into that and into you know, condensing video and everything else. And a lot of that just came out of the adult field. And a lot of it was funded, ironically, by mainstream companies um, that were putting money into it because it was obviously an area where there were a lot of people thinking about these kinds of issues. Um, but from the legal side, copyright was a huge issue, even trademark. Um, Copyright with parodies, you know, I'm sure we've all seen the adult films that are named closely uh, uh, after some you know, blockbuster movie or things of that sort. Uh, and even with government regulations, which you had um, really the first effort to try to control content online. Um, I'm not a free speech attorney, but cases like, um, you know, the ACLU versus Reno uh, was a 1997 case and involved a, a law called the Communications Decency Act. And that was really the first big effort to control adult online. Mm -hmm. And there were questions about, you know, if you knowingly uh, sent anyone under 18, uh, anything that was lewd or patently offensive, um, sexual, you know, anything of that sort. And was that going to be allowed? How are we going to deal with that online? And, uh, the, you know, the courts came forward and kind of surprisingly really struck it down and basically said, you know, there are going to be very few limitations. Um, and that law in particular um, was unique because, there's an aspect of it that a lot of people don't know about that serves as one of the foundations of the Internet, and uh, it was Section 230, and Section 230 deals with essentially defamation. And what it says is that websites, uh, as long as they're passive, cannot be um, sued for defamation based on comments or publications made by their users. Mm -hmm. So you think about you know, Facebook right. uh, or Twitter, Twitter being or, the classic. Or, right, right, or any message board or whatever. So like that's that I, – I, I, the term that I, I – is it safe harbor or whatever? So like if you own a website, I, I, you're not liable if I go on there and do something really terrible. Right. Yeah. And with the Communications Decency Act with Section 230, there's no safe harbor. You, you're just you're just clear. You don't have to do anything uh, compared to like the DMCA where you do, where you have to take some affirmative steps and compliance steps with the Communications Decency Act. It's just free and clear. Now, flash forward to today, and you're seeing efforts to try to limit that uh, because companies like Yelp, you know, they're they're entirely based, their entire business model is based on Section 230 uh, because. When a company gets a negative review, you know, if I get a negative review, I'm unhappy, um, you know, I start complaining, well, can I go ahead and sue Yelp uh, in an effort to get that taken down? And under Section 230, the answer is no. 
Well, all right. Yeah, we've we've mentioned the DMCA enough times. Um, that that's 1998, I think. Uh, I I've read you you call it the the toilet paper of internet law. So, t- tell me tell me what to think about the DMCA. Right. So uh, to understand the DMCA, we have to actually step back a few years. <clears throat> Excuse me. And in 1995, uh, we have the World Intellectual Property Organization, which the U.S. is a member, uh, and they were looking at the internet and thinking, hmm. Where's all this going to go? How are we going to address you know these various intellectual property issues, of which copyright obviously is one? Uh, and so there were guidelines put out. Basically, here's the way we think we can do it. And in '98, the U.S. basically followed most of those guidelines and it came up with the DMCA. Um, and it is the toilet paper uh, of the internet. It's an important foundational law. It's very controversial. People, there are three parties involved in the DMCA: the person who's posting content, the copyright owner, and the website owner. Um, now I'm a business lawyer, so I represent the website owners. And for us, the DMCA is great um, because it creates, you know, as you mentioned previously, it creates a safe harbor. And what that basically says is that the the website or the app or the internet connected platform, whatever it is, uh, cannot be held liable for copyright infringement for um, uh, infringing content uploaded by a user. So without this law, we wouldn't have Facebook, Twitter. Uh, you know, a lot of these sites because they would have just been stomped into the ground by, you know, a tsunami of uh, copyright infringement lawsuits when they first launched. So it's very important from that perspective. Now, there are a lot of criticisms of the law, and there, many of them are very valid, uh, but nobody's really come up with a better solution since then. Um, so it, it serves as one of those foundational elements because otherwise we would just have tons of copyright infringement lawsuits, courts would be backed up, and we would probably end up with regulations that would be uh, uh, not great for the web. So that was 98, and, and <clears throat> right on top of that, like within a couple years comes, you know, Napster and the whole file sharing and BitTorrent and all that stuff. Um, so how come, how was like media and, and sharing music, like how was that different than what the DMCA put into place in terms of, um, you know, setting some sort of like, these are the rules for, for doing stuff online. How, how did Napster run afoul of that? Um, well, in the case of Napster, it became uh, whether you had knowledge of it, whether you were actively involved in it. So Napster was promoting uh, essentially infringement. I mean, they had statements on their websites. They had those uh, emails statement. from Sean Parker that were came out in trial, right? Right. Yeah. So they were they were not passive. In, in the situation with the compliance is you have to be very very careful that in that um, you don't show any kind of active involvement in uh, the infringement process. So I'll give you an example of a case that came up in uh, the Western courts here recently that's troubling. They have said that um, there was a website that just escaped me, but they had moderators. And so when people submitted content, when users submitted content, the moderators would look at the content and then decide what went up and what didn't. And the court ruled that uh, the site had waived the DMCA safe harbor provisions because those moderators were making decisions as to the content, so therefore they were active. Um, so that's really kind of the distinguishing mark. Now, in, in Napster, there were also other issues about, you know, um, whether they knew of the infringement and were making money off of it, which clearly they were, uh, and, and other aspects that don't really come up as much today. Um, but, yeah, Napster kind of face-planted on that one. I'm not sure what the theory was. But in their defense at that time, we were still, you know, in a situation. I mean, when we started talking, you were asking about what were the foundational laws. Well, there really weren't any. Uh, and there were legitimate questions about how are these going to apply online. So um, I've, I've talked to actual Napster and YouTube people on this question. Um, and so if you, don't, if you don't know the answer to this, that's fine. But from a legal perspective, why couldn't Napster hack it, but YouTube actually could? Why, why didn't YouTube just get sued into oblivion just like Napster did? Um, because they weren't on the radar uh, right up front and because mm. YouTube's – to be honest, and because YouTube, I think, was um, – there were actually some different attacks that were going to be directed at YouTube that were video-related, uh, and those failed pretty quickly. And then YouTube was attacked. They were hit by some of the big publishers, right, right, right. and you saw that come to fruition. And to be quite honest, at that point, YouTube was very profitable. They had a lot of – well, not profitable, but they had you know the backing of Google, uh, and so they, they could litigate those matters. Even now, um, you know, with the DMCA, you're supposed to follow this compliance process. Well, arguably, if you miss a step, you waive the safe harbor. And, and you know, from my look at YouTube, they don't really follow all the steps. And people say to me, well, how come YouTube does this? 
And the answer is because they don't care about the safe harbor. They've got, you know, massive amounts of money sitting there, <laughs> you know, as their capital uh, retainings, they, you know, that this money, if they get hit for, you know, some kind of a copyright uh, infringement case based on something a user upload, you know, it's not really going to impact them uh, that much. So there's a question of, you know, resources as well. Um, but it is a good question. And uh, I think YouTube, particularly the outset, they made more of an effort to try to not um, be so openly uh, aggressive in the fact that, hey, just let upload anything and we'll all make money. Um, you know, those kinds of, of deals. Now, if somebody was to go through their old email, um, you know, I'm sure there would be some things in there they would be uncomfortable with. Um, so uh, w with YouTube, we're talking about the, the coming of social and, and, and you know, this, this idea that we were talking about earlier that, um, you know, it's, it's no longer I'm a company or I'm an artist creating content. I'm just, I'm, I'm just a person that's like, I'm just, you know, sharing a photo of what happened to me today and things like that. Um, so basically social couldn't have ever happened without that safe harbor provision and, and that sort of thing. Um, it, like, was that, there's no way that, <laughs> that the people that, that created those laws could could have conceived of that sort of thing, right? They, they weren't thinking of like the here comes everybody aspect of, of social media as we're thinking of it today. No, they got very lucky. <laughs> it's straight up luck. <laughs> well, not straight up luck. I, I think that what they were looking at was, uh, you know, balancing test. How are we going to allow this medium to grow? Uh, I think everybody recognizes there was potential for it to become a, a significant economic uh, foundation, something new. Um, where, where money could be made. So how could you allow for that, but also, um, you know, try to protect uh, people who own intellectual property or whatever it may be. And they tried to, you know, they tried to go with the balancing test. And in some laws, they got really lucky. I mean, the Communications Decency Act, which deals with the defamation issue. Well, most of that law was actually invalidated by the Supreme Court. So the, the key clause that protects most websites now isn't is part of a law that otherwise you know, was terminated. Mm. <laughs> and they've never really dealt with that. Mm. Uh, it's still valid, but I mean, it's it's just kind of what it is. Uh, and then with social, you know, part of social also is that the platforms are set up with the idea of these laws in mind. And so, you know, you have issues now that are coming up, um, you know, that, that don't, they don't really incorporate those problems. So maybe you have a company that comes on and they see, hey, you wore, you know, our shirt, you said something nice about it. Well, can we turn around and put that on our site? Can we put that in our ads? And it's, it's that whole sharing concept that, um, you know, it's difficult to, to moderate from a legal perspective, but these sites, when they created their guidelines, you know, they already kind of addressed this. When you put a, a video up on YouTube, you know, you're agreeing to their terms and conditions and they have licensing uh, issues that are in their licensing clauses that specifically address issues like the DMCA and, you know, are you going to license this? Are you not going to license this? What's the scope going to be? Uh, and so they created, you know, the terms are created kind of with, the laws in mind so that as you actually use the platform, you, you know, you're going to be in compliance with the law, not always. Uh, and there are all kinds of problems and things that can creep through. Um, but, the, you know, there was at least some effort to do that. So it wasn't completely luck. Um, but I think when, you know, in late 90s, 98, 97, um, when, you know, the government was looking at these issues, they did a pretty good job, I got to be honest. I mean, if you think about what the internet was in 1998, and what it is now, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, the idea that the DMCA would even still be remotely, uh, you know, applicable or remotely accurate, you know, it's kind of amazing. Now there are other areas where they completely face planted. You know, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act mm -hmm, is a mm -hmm. joke. Um, you know, so it just kind of depends. Um, okay, so we're we're basically talking about modern stuff now. So, <clears throat> a couple questions about modern stuff, and and this uh, acknowledging that you mostly work with the companies, so. This is sort of a, a cheeky question, but um, is it sort of a business model now for these platforms to create Byzantine terms of service <laughs> agreements so that like we're never ever supposed to know what their real, it's almost like they're hiding the business model in the terms of service. Like, is that a fair assessment or a little too cynical? Uh, it's a bit cynical, but there's certain truth to it. Yes, there's an element of truth to that. Um, you know, obviously it depends on the specific site. I think the problem you have in defense of the companies, and again, full disclosure, I work with the companies, so I have that bias, is, is some of these issues are very difficult to deal with uh, legally, but also from the idea of being creative. 
So if you come up with something new, you know, you think talk about social media. Well, you know, copyright infringement, we all screen copyright infringement, fair use, this, that, and the other. Well, what happens when a company that otherwise, you know, has sued people right and left for copyright infringement starts releasing content that they want to be shared? Um, you know, and how do you deal with that from a legal perspective? Because, you know, if Getty Images suddenly start saying, hey, use all this content, uh, well, you know, for the last 15 years, they've been sending out, you know, we're going to kill you, we're mm, going to see the mm. living crap out of your letters. Uh, you know, <laughs> how do you deal with that? And unfortunately, the terms and conditions are really the only area to do that. Uh, and then you also run into issues now with jurisdiction, different jurisdictions require different things. Europe's about to pass new uh, or enact new copyright mm. laws. Um, you know, and as a company, one of the beauties of the web is that, you, you know, you have a worldwide audience. And one of the downsides is you have a worldwide audience. Uh, you know, there's a reason Apple is requiring you to, uh, you know, agree to their new terms and conditions every three days um, because they're trying to, to deal with some of the developments that are out there. So some of it is paranoid attorneys trying to just make sure that, you know, they're taking into account some of the latest rulings. But, yeah, in other cases, yeah, people are burying things in there, um, you know, particularly related to monetization of whatever you're providing them. Uh, you know, the Internet's unique in that it creates business models where the customers do most of the work. Right. Facebook. Uh Right, exactly. Well, and, and speaking of Facebook, and this is directly applicable to, uh, you know, ripped from the headline stuff, like you, you mentioned this earlier, the, the idea that because of Safe Harbor, um, because they can't, uh, if you're a platform, you can't be seen to be choosing content over other content or whatever. Is that one of the big when, when when Facebook and all these other platforms talk about how they want to combat fake news or they want to combat bias uh, that or that's on their platforms these sorts of things they can only go so far because if they go too far then they would they would open themselves up legally right yes I mean there's also more of the paradigm of you know who decides um, you know and at what but that's point... the question I'm asking is that if are, are, to what degree can they d decide? Because if they decide that our platform is being harmed because there's too much of this sort of bad content or whatever, um, so we want to try to curate in some way. Is there? Are they sort of? Are their hands tied to a degree? Because if they curate too much, they're in trouble. Not in the United States, but mm -hmm. in other jurisdictions, yes. So I'll give you an example. In the U.S., um, you know, you go on Facebook, somebody publishes something with, you know, a Nazi T-shirt. Well, it, you know, does that violate the guidelines of Facebook or not? Honestly, I don't know. Probably does. Um, you know, and they can take it down or do this, or maybe they can leave it up. Maybe they say we believe in free speech. Even if it's offensive, we're going to leave it up. But you go to Germany, and you just broke a law. And the website is liable for that as well. The website's required to take down any Nazi paraphernalia. And so, you know, the question becomes, well, you know, how are they going to address those issues? Uh, in the U.S., you know, we're pretty, pretty open with those rules. Uh, you know, as long as it's not something uh, that we find offensive as a matter of, of, of law, child porn, something like that. Uh, you know, we're going to allow the websites to, to rule on that because the websites are private companies. However, when you get to a certain size, an argument becomes it can be made that you're a public utility, essentially. And is Google, Facebook, are they starting to reach that size where, um, you know, we start looking at them that way? And I think when you see some of the things that Facebook says, Zuckerberg says, I think they're worried about that. When and, you say when you say that they're a public utility, is that just a, a turn of phrase or is that like an actual legal term that would be applicable? Uh, it's a turn of phrase by me, but essentially okay, they're, becoming, okay. they're becoming an element of right, the public, right, right, much right. like much like the old telephone companies. Were, right, you know, they were, exactly, they were, yeah. You know, a monopoly by another name. Um, you know, monopoly antitrust uh, in the U.S. against the large internet companies is pretty much a joke. Um, you know, the FTC, they've just dropped the ball completely, and mm -hmm. I don't see them picking it up anytime soon. Whereas in Europe, for instance, you see Google get hit with, you know, antitrust fines of, I don't know what right. it was, $2 billion, some large amount. Um, you know, in the U.S., arguably, you know, that they, they created some... It took some antitrust steps against Apple, uh, you know, and they were fined. I think it was $22 million, which, you know, you and I know is absolutely nothing. Uh, and so it's just kind of a difference of where the jurisdictions are. But, yeah, no, I, I use this as a term. But if they, they reach that point where they become, you know, an integral part of society, then they do face the potential for regulations. Even if those regulations maybe aren't particularly restrictive, they're also going to have to deal with the public backlash of it. You're seeing it now. 
where you know politicians get them in their uh, you know in their scope and start having at them, and that's never good for share prices and things of that sort. Well, so we, we we've been mentioning that in Europe they're doing it differently. Um, what are your thoughts on GDPR? I imagine that over the last year or so, that's probably been a lot of what you've been helping people with. But like, is is GDPR, in your opinion, a step in the right direction or a, a wrong step? Or what's the philosophy behind GDPR? Uh, I think the GDPR. Well, again, I work with businesses. GDPR is. I understand the idea for it uh, and the basis for it, which I think is is good. I don't really have any problem with it. I think the GDPR itself, the drafted uh, regulations, is an abomination, frankly. Uh, it is one of the worst um, drafted regulations I've seen in a long time, and it's having the exact effect most people thought it would be and what it would have, which is you're seeing investments you know start to die off in the EU for anything related to um, you know the online environment because it creates a lot of rules and regulations that really are unnecessary and really harmful for smaller companies. It's essentially treating you know somebody who has a very small e-commerce site in similar manner as it would Facebook. Uh, you know, there are some exceptions, in, you know, Article 30 and things of that sort. But right, because they they said when they drafted the law that they're that we're not going to take the hammer to everybody. We'll have some sort of sense of scale and 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 things like that. But but just to be on the safe side, by default, everyone has to act like their Facebook. Everyone has to put those annoying things that we at the bottom of their website. We we use cookies and things like that. Is that what you're saying? Yes, but I think it goes much farther than what people understand. Um, so uh, to comply with these rules and regulations, you have to have um, a lot of internal work done. So you have to have data maps, uh, you know, mapping where, where the data is going through your site and your system. You have to have uh, data process processing agreements with all of your controllers, which means anybody who's uh, providing you with services uh, that might have access to that personal information. That's why you're seeing all the cookie pop-ups. Um, you have to have, you know, all these different records. Uh, and so on and so forth. And the problem is when the uh, Article 29 Working Party says these things, like we don't want to bring the hammer, well, it doesn't mean anything because they don't enforce it. Uh, each each member state has a supervisory authority who acts mm. as the enforcement agency. Okay, And some of these enforcement agencies, like the ICO in the UK, they're pretty reasonable. You know, They'll send you a letter. They're, they're mostly interested in getting you to comply. Um, but like the CNIL in France or the German supervisory authority, they're completely out of control. And they issue fines right and left. And one of the problems that companies have, not ironically, not Facebook and Google, but the little guys, is you know a lot of these regulations are very difficult to insure against. So when you get hit with one of these fines, it's coming out of your cash flow. And if you don't have that cash flow, um, you know you're in problems. Now they're going to scale the fines to your cash flow and all that kind of stuff. But still, you know if you take a, a, a big hit, you know it can cripple a business. Uh, and with the people that you talk to who know the individuals who are involved in the Article 29 Working Party, uh, you know, they're alarmed at how <laughs> how little some of these people seem to understand how the Internet works. So, for instance, let's think of a basic e-commerce site right now. You know, if we go back 20 years, you would spend a ton of money developing a website, and you can still do it now. Or you can take something like WordPress, and you start putting modules on and plugins and things of this sort. Well, each of those plugins and modules now, you're, you're going to have to go out and get contractual agreements from under the GDPR. You need to have these things. They, they need to guarantee they're complying with the GDPR, uh, so on and so forth. If you use plugins, which tons of sites use So they, they, they have to uh, 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 to you that, that we're compliant, and you have to show that you've checked that they're compliant because if you're serving it up to your users, you're, by default, you're, 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 vou you're vouching for anything that you're serving up to your users. Yes, and you're strictly liable for them. Mm. So not only do you need that agreement, but you're taking the risk that they're actually complying. And so if you have somebody who isn't, and that comes to fruition in, a, you know, in an audit, and the supervisory authority finds that, you are liable for that. So that it, it, in a way, fundamentally breaks the concept of like, you know, the plug-in ecosystem or the platform ecosystem or the off-the-shelf. I'm pulling different components off the shelf. It certainly radically changes it. <laughs> mm. and, you see, and you see the reaction from some companies. I mean, I'm sure you heard of you know, all the newspapers that blocked Europe. Uh, and there are some, you know, significant retailers that did as well, uh, because their monetization systems just—it's just impossible to comply. Now, it, we're overstating the simplicity of how you comply with the GDPR, but the point of the GDPR, which is understandable, you know, that people should have control of their personal information. I, I don't have any problem with that. I think there are better ways to do it. California, 
uh, you know, passed the California Consumer Privacy Act, often called GDPR Light. It's not really, but you know, they did that, and it it shows kind of a better approach. So what the the California law says is, okay, we're going to require that you do these things. Um, however, we're going to uh, set thresholds, for instance. So you only have to comply if the business uh, brings in $25 million in sales uh, or more than $50,000. Uh, the information you collect comes from uh, more than 50,000 people who are located in California or um, you generate more than 50% of your revenue from uh, the sale of their personal information. And so what we're doing is restricting the requirements to the larger group of you know larger group of internet companies. The estimation is maybe five hundred thousand, and frankly, these are the people that you're worried about selling your information: Facebook, Google, these kinds of guys, uh, you know, the, the big data uh, companies. And so it allows for you know uh, an ecology of of companies to just start up, to get up and running without having to deal with all these compliance processes. The other thing that you see with the GDPR that is somewhat bizarre is you have to have a legal basis for collecting personal information. Now, that's not bizarre, but they want granular consent, and so you end up with a situation where, um, you know, it hasn't happened yet because, frankly, we haven't seen a lot of enforcement actions, but what you're going to see are consent forms that say you go to a website, it pops up, you can barely see the website, uh, and it's a form saying, you know, we want to collect your information for all of these individual uses, and you have to check a box for each one, and, and that's where it's headed. And so we end up kind of it's with terms you know, of terms of service on steroids, like even more annoying if that's possible. Right. Except you don't even get to the terms of service. This is the page you see when you land on the website. Right. Before you could even see anything. Right. Right. And so what happens? Nobody, nobody's going to click it. People are just going to try and get rid of it or they're just going to consent to everything. You know, it doesn't have any realistic effect. It's like the, uh, the warning on your mattress, you know, and it, it becomes, you know, kind of bizarre. And you already seen complaints from people in Europe. You know, about all these pop-ups, yeah. all, the, all the cookie pop-ups. I mean, they're annoying. And the, the strangest thing about it and the most infuriating thing <laughs> is that, that the EU has acknowledged that the cookie pop-ups don't work. Mm. They've, they've said – because the cookie pop-ups actually existed previous to the GDPR. You're seeing U.S. companies now employ it. Um, but they existed prior to that. And they've done studies, and they found that it has no effect. The people – you know, the first time they ever get on the internet, sure, they read it. But after that – they're just trying to get past it so they can get to whatever the content is. Um, so I think that there are better solutions, uh, you know, to come up with something like that. And California's, you know, California's effort is is miles ahead of that because there's a practical aspect to it. And and I have to tell you, this is probably the first time I've ever complimented the California legislature. This is the group that <laughs> that that passed an anti revenge porn, you know, a revenge revenge porn law, and excluded selfies from it. Uh, you know, and for listeners that aren't aware, selfies make up about 80% of all revenge porn. So it was a law that applied to almost nothing. Um, but they got it right in this. You know, there's, there's problems with the law, but it's much more of a usable medium. I think in Europe, you know, there's just this view that companies are bad. Um, you know, and so you, so you get these strange rulings. It's not even companies. It's people. There's a rule. There's well, a law in France. It sounds like what you're saying, though, is it, it has to be some sort of like – a graduated system like there has to be some sort of sense of scale where um, you, you set these laws in place but then the enforcement of it or the penalties of it or whatever um, has a has a has a sliding scale where it, it changes depending on on what actual actor is involved absolutely yes absolutely I think that's completely fair and I think that the other thing about it is I think that there should be some aspect of technology that's involved so, for example, uh, Article 8 of the GDPR, um, you know, it's, it's received a good bit of attention because of the sheer bizarre stupidity of it. The GDPR, one of the statements behind the GDPR, why are we, why are we putting this new regulation together, was to create one simplified regulation so that, you know, companies didn't have to deal with, you know, different rules and what have you in all the 28 member states. Well, Article 8 says uh, it's the equivalent of the Child uh, Children's Online Protection uh, Privacy Act in the U.S., and it says uh, that before you collect information from uh, a child uh, online, you have to have verified parental consent. And so uh, the age was set at 13, which is the age that's used in the U.S., and then on the last draft of the GDPR, without any discussion that anybody seems to be able to find, they bumped the age up to 16. Hmm. And then... So people started reacting because think about – let's think about Facebook. Whatever you think about Facebook, how many 15-year-olds do you think are on Facebook? Mm -hmm. And and how does Facebook know? Mm -hmm. 
So how how are they going to go back and get consent? How are they you know how are they going to deal with all these issues? So companies start complaining right away. And so the the answer from the EU was okay. Well, here's what we're going to say. We're going to say we're going to we're going to leave the default age at 16, but each member state can now designate its own age between 16 and 13. So we have some company, uh, some countries where it's 14, some where it's 15, some where it's 16. <laughs> it's, you know. Well, so is this the last couple of questions here? Is this what I've seen you uh, speak and write about before about how the World Wide Web will not be so worldwide in the future? Like, is this just sort of it's going to be jurisdictional chaos at this point where there's no way to even know if you put something online what you might be in trouble and where about? <laughs> yes. Well, that's already here. Mm. I mean, it is now the chances of you, you know, a, a small U.S. company being, you know, prosecuted in Mongolia are pretty small. Um, but yeah, no, that's already started, and yes, we're already definitely seeing the splinter net, the idea of the splinter net. Um, and it isn't so much that you have to be worried about being prosecuted in these areas as that you may start seeing companies break up uh, into, you know, a parent company with subsidiaries. Gee, I wonder what large internet company we've seen that do in the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, they're going to create subsidiaries for certain areas. Now for smaller companies that don't have the resources to do that, you know, there's going to be a point at which you're going to have to start picking jurisdictions, uh, where you may target. So if you're a U.S. company, you know, you're in pretty good shape because the U.S. is a lucrative market. Um, but if you're going to get 5% of your sales out of the EU, well, do you want to go through all the cost and compliance effort to, uh, you know, to make sure you comply with the GDPR? And what about the new e-privacy directive coming down, which is going to, you know, stomp internet marketing or email marketing into the ground? Or um, memes. Or, there's that law that, is, that people say is going to make memes illegal, essentially. Yeah, it's not going to make memes illegal. What what they're doing is they're requiring, um, you know, online platforms with that move. I forgot what the wording is. It's so vague. It's scary. It's like large amounts of data, um, you know, that they have to filter. And so the problem for those companies, of course, is, well, what does that mean? Where's the line drawn? And so what they'll do is they'll just start, you know, precluding anything that looks even remotely questionable. And memes would certainly be that, um, you know, they also have the tax, the link tax coming in Europe. Right. Which is if you know you link to a news story, uh, you know you're gonna have to pay a tax on that. It's really a licensing fee. I don't even know why they call it a tax. Um, but you know then there are questions there. You get back to fake news. What's a legitimate news site? Um, how much of it can you take without paying? Who's who's gonna collect this? You know how are they gonna enforce it? <laughs> it's, it's a mess. Um, I'm I'm gonna ask you this, and I'm gonna edit it out if you can't answer this because it's outside your scope. But I'm I'm curious. Um, and no one will ever hear it if, I, if I'm wrong about this. Um, this is jumping to a completely different topic. I have always heard that things like um, data breaches and and the um, the uh, what you could be on the hook for if if you say your users uh, social security a million people's social security numbers um, get uh, compromised things like that. That there's no real serious settled law, at least in the U.S., for the like the fine regime, and so like I've seen people say, well, like that's what we can change right now. So like if you have the Esperion or, or the Marriott hack or whatever, that there's no real um, regime in place for like this is a super serious data breach versus a minor data breach. Like is that true or again, do you not know that? Like do you know anything about that in terms of? Um, is there a regime in place for people losing my data? Um, there's safe harbors. Uh, a lot of it's state law. From my understanding, I don't deal with the area that much. A lot of it's state law. And so if you f- comply with the state laws regarding disclosure, uh, you know, you put out a press release letting people know. Um, in those situations, you're insulated from a lot of the liability. However, we have seen class action lawsuits that go after it in a different manner. But those are private actions, but they'll, mm-hmm. they'll go after it under. Well, and that's know. part of uh, GDPR, too, is like they have to disclose those things within a certain period of time or they run afoul of GDPR, right? Correct. Yes. And the California law, a number of states have that law. The GDPR law is particularly interesting because uh, I went to a seminar with a person from the Working 29 Party was there answering questions. And the question was put to her, I think, under the GDPR, it's a 72-hour disclosure period. Uh, but in the U.S., if you're a significant company and you have a major breach, like maybe the Marriott had, the FBI gets involved. The FBI does not want you disclosing that mm. because right, the FBI, right, right. they're hunting. Right. They're, they're going to go hunting. So you don't want to tell you know the person who did it, hey, here we come. Uh, and so that question was put to her, what do we do? And her answer was, I don't know. 
<laughs> <laughs> and but in her defense, that gives you kind of the feel why I was talking about the splinter net is that you know you have jurisdictions that have conflicting standards. And so how how do you handle those? It's a no win situation in many, many areas. And I'll also tell you in the privacy law field uh, that this has been the view for years. The questions, you know, particularly with data breaches is not, you know, if you're a sizable company, not if you're going to get hacked, it's just when. Right. And and then how you're going to deal with that. And these companies have, you know, data teams set up to deal with the, the, the actual hack part of it. But they also have teams set up to how are we going to deal with the legal side of this. And there are some companies out there, you know, and some smart hackers, to be quite honest, that they get that data and then they don't do anything with it. Instead, they turn around to the company and say, pay us X amount and we'll give you your data back. And those companies pay that amount, right. and you never hear about it. Right, right, right. Um, all right, absolute final question, and it, thank you so much for your time. It, it, should we the, – the the internet itself is going to turn 50 this year. The web is going to turn 30, depending on how you count. Should we be – uh, should we be disturbed by the fact that everything we've been talking about, everything still seems to be so unsettled, so legally not uh, settled yet? Or is that just the nature of technology? And maybe like we should take heart from that. Like we're still learning and we're still evolving. And, and, and so we can still we can still make things right and fix things. Yeah, I wouldn't be worried about it. Um, there are a couple of reasons. One, a lot of the internet law is settled, but it's just a lot of the basic things. You know, are, are links copyright infringement or not? And, you know, those kinds of things that are key. If you use the internet, um, you know, if you're not a business, if you're just using the internet, I mean, a lot of it you're going to be fine on. I wouldn't worry about it. Uh, the other thing is the law trails whatever developments there are in commerce by usually about 10 years, um, just because of the trial appeal process. Um, and so a lot of these things are coming up just because they're finally being dealt with. Um, but the internet, I mean, look at the last 10 years, the last 20 years, um, you know, how much it has evolved. I mean, it's going to keep evolving. There are things coming that none of us have thought about virtual reality. Um, you know, uh, AI, Google's little AI tools, you know, that are out there, you know, making hair appointments uh, that you can't tell that they're, you know, computer versus humans. Um, the, uh, the evolution of tech has almost always just greatly outraced, you know, anything on the legal side. So I, I'm not all that worried about it. I just think that it's unfortunate sometimes that governments come in and try and pass these all encompassing regulations and laws as though the internet is static. Uh, you know, to the GDPR, to the EU's credit, they've tried to anticipate the future by leaving a lot of things fairly wide open. Um, you know, I don't think it's the right approach, but to the credit, they have at least tried to do that. You know, with other countries, you know, they look at it as a photo, a photograph. And then, you know, they issue these rules and regulations and it's, you know, five years later, you have something like, um, you know, virtual, you know, virtual reality or some kind of streaming or something like that. Um, that wasn't contemplated and the rules don't apply. And then it becomes this mess of people trying to <laughs> figure out, you know, how they're going to deal with that. Um, but there's always going to be laws. It's always going to be the state. There's always going to be a certain element of chaos. And uh, I think it'll probably just be fascinating to see where it goes, particularly on the jurisdiction issues, because the thing that they're going to have to settle is, you know, whose laws apply where. And that's going on right now. Google's, you know, in the middle of it. Uh, you have the EU, or you have Canada of all places trying to enforce you know, a Canadian Supreme Court ruling in the U.S. and the U.S. court court said uh, no. <laughs> so, so we now have this limbo where Google has to do something in Canada but not in the U.S. And you know, how ultimately is that going to play out? And I think eventually you're going to have, you know, some kind of uh, worldwide standard set for for that uh, practice because they almost have to. The internet's evolved to that point where it is truly worldwide, and uh, we, we're going to have to recognize that. Uh, Richard Chapeau, thank you. Absolutely fascinating. My pleasure. If you like what you've heard on this episode, please support us by subscribing to the podcast so you can get great news stories and conversations every two weeks. And please buy the book that was based on this podcast, How the Internet Happened from Netscape to the iPhone by me, Brian McCullough. Order it now wherever books are sold. How the Internet Happened. And if you weren't aware, I host a daily tech news podcast every weekday that comes out at 5 p.m. In that show, I tell you what happened that day in the world of tech. It's only 15 to 20 minutes long, and it's great if you love tech news. Search your podcast app for Ride Home to find the show. It's called The Tech Meme Ride Home. Thanks. Thanks.